We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go on over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. That way they don't get lost in the mix. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we've got a question from Ryan Peach, who writes, looking for a good two-player co-op, specifically two-player only. As a blind meeple asking this question, I'd mentally discounted many games. I play with Sighted Assistance, a game where the second player does something different but still interesting, and where both parties can talk to each other would do. All right, first off, I do have to say, sorry, Ryan, I do apologize for taking so dang long to get to this question. There's a reason for this, though. I, I don't really have a good answer for you, still. I have had this question sitting in the queue for over a year, like since we started the podcast. This is literally one of the first questions we ever got. And I see it now and then. Every time I go, oh, what are we going to talk about this week? I see this come up and I go, oh, there's got to be one. There's got to be something. So I go searching and I try to find an accessible two-player cooperative game and I fail time and time again. You know, and I think one strong problem is that there still isn't enough push for companies to ensure they are accessible or at the very least indicate in what ways they are accessible in a standardized manner across the industry. I know Ryan has cited assistance, but in a game, for instance, where every card has a paragraph of text to play it, how enjoyable yeah. is that game going to be for either player with all that going on? Yeah. Now, there are some games that we can definitely recommend. The problem is that two-player only part of Ryan's question, because there's almost no two-player only cooperative games in general accessible or not. Uh, the first one that comes to mind that I played and owned was in Then We Held Hands. This is a very cool card game where players work together playing two-sided cards where you can see the backs of my cards and I, I can see the, the fronts of my cards and the backs of your cards. And we're using each other's hands to try to move gems on a board to try to get them to meet. And it's a really unique theme where you're actually having an argument and trying to get along by using different arguments. It's, it's very cool, very solid game. But there is no way a vision impaired person is going to be able to play this game. And especially there's not this isn't one where you can help your opponent because you have to be able to see each other's cards. That's how the whole game works. So it totally disqualifies from Ryan's question here. Yeah, it's true. I think a lot of times when designers think co-op, they think group, not pair. Uh, though often they'll insert ways to play it as a duo, duo often yeah. doubling up on characters, especially as a method to bring that player count down. Yeah. Now, another one that's come out, and I think it came out since Ryan asked me the question, because I don't remember catching it right away, was Codenames Duet. Now, this is a two-player-only version of Codenames. And again, this is a two-player-only co-op, perfect for what Ryan wants, but I can't see someone with sighted assistance playing Codenames. Like, that's just not going to work. <laughs> like, you're going to have one person playing both sides if they're going to have to read out what all the cards are. I guess they could say, here's what all the cards that are out now are. Like, maybe it's possible. Yeah, just a quick glance through the rules indicates that while it could be made as an accessible game, in its current state, it's just not. Uh, if you aren't able to read, identify color, identify physical actions, and point to individual identified cards without another person's without that other person's assistance, it just doesn't seem feasible. Yeah. So now there is one. There actually is one game out there that perfectly fits the bill. Like it, it really does. But it's got a rather unique theme, and I personally don't know if Ryan would be interested in this, and that is Consentical. This is a two-player cooperative game about a consensual sexual encounter between a curious human and a tentacled alien. Yeah, this one really depends on who you're playing with and the comfort levels between that person. Uh, if you're playing with your assistance person who happens to be a family member, you might want to stay clear of this because things could get weird. Yes. So I don't know. There, there is our one recommendation. We, we do have one game for you, Ryan, that is a two player cooperative only that we think is accessible, though you may not want to play that with very many people <laughs> and possibly not in public. So oh. I guess that's our official answer, right? Um, I don't have more to offer at this point. Now, I do see Xanister in the chat is talking about Street Masters. That's not one I know, so maybe that's one we can look into while we keep going. So what I'm going to do here, because I don't have more to say, is we're going to deep dive 
some of the best two-player cooperative games without the two-player only limitation. We'll remove that limitation. We're going to look at multiple player co-op games that are great with two players. Now, there's a bit of a caveat here. Many of the games I'm going to mention tonight, I haven't personally played. See, the person I'm most likely to play a two-player game with is Deanna over there. And while Deanna pretty much hates most cooperative games, like I'm still kind of shocked we got her to sit down with Tori and Kat to play through Pandemic Legacy and then got her into Gloomhaven as well. But those are rare exceptions of games she actually enjoys. So I don't get a lot of chance to actually play two-player cooperative games. Actually, we there's a f small subset of two-player games we even play, and none of them are cooperative. So just so you know, the following list is a mix of my personal experience, games I played, or a pretty common consensus found throughout bloggers and podcasters, games that come up on multiple best lists and board game geek ratings. Well, and I have to say, you know, we don't actually have it in this list, but she did like Horrified. Yes, she did like <laughs> There are a few. She likes yeah. Ghostbusters, and everyone hates that game, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, up first, I think uh, the game, uh, cooperative game that we all know and uh, consider as part of the, uh, the, you know, envelope of tabletop <laughs> bellhop games, Gloomhaven. Yeah, that would be Gloomhaven. The, the, the number one game in the world still, still rated number one, and I think for good reason. That may change. I don't know if people have seen it yet, but Frosthaven was announced today an official full sequel, full new campaign, all new characters. Uh, until that comes out, though, there is Gloomhaven. Um, Gloomhaven, I, best with three. You probably don't want to do what I'm doing and play it with four because it gets really hard, but really good with two. And I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be accessible with a helper. Now, you definitely need the helper, but... I, again, I don't know. How, it depends on your level of visual acuity and what you can and can't do. But if it's a matter of seeing things on the map and be able to move things on the map, that's all going to be accessible. You may need someone to read off the cards, but even the um, the combat cards are very clear and bright with large symbols. It's it's even larger than most. Um, what do you call that? I can't think of the word for the the big text that you can get for people with vision impaired. But it's all large, bright text. But then the cards is tons of tiny text that the order of the text matters and it's very fiddly. So that's where you may need some help. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I think Gloom is definitely something that's that's accessible with assistance. Uh, you you would I, I there's too much reading, I think, to uh, to not have either a uh, well, yeah, you know, I say that. But there are a number of PDF versions of everything available. Oh, well that will not even blow up, but read, could be used yeah. into, uh, into a reader. Um, although controlling where you start in the manual, I suppose, could be uh, a little tough. But I, I, I think there are probably reader-capable uh, versions of that manual available now. I wonder um, if anyone has put the decks of cards well, in the PDF. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I, I would be surprised if they hadn't. Uh, but also, the Gloomhaven Helper apps... There may be one. There are so many Gloomhaven helper out, uh, apps out there. There may be some that are either uh, screen reader capable or already enabled uh, to uh, to work in that manner. Yes, yeah, so that that may actually work. Yeah. So I said Gloomhaven. Now you're you are looking at a investment. It is not a cheap game. Uh, I would recommend if you're planning to play with a partner, you and the partner split the cost at least at that point. Yep. Uh, but you are going to get a lot of gameplay out of this. Like we have been playing it for over a year, not every Friday, but pretty often doing um, pretty often playing almost every Friday. And we still got a long way to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the, the one thought is if you do have a play space, you can dedicate to it. That does make things easier mm -hmm. because the setup and teardown is, uh, is trying. But if you do have to set up and tear down, I think we we definitely recommend a uh, insert of some sort. Yeah, uh, going going on that going with that game with just the default uh, packaging is not. Well, at uh, least ideal. some packaging. It doesn't necessarily have to be a purchased. But some uh, box form, insert, yeah, but some like, form of insert uh, some management form of organization, organization is required. Yeah. Tupperware or otherwise. Um. So Ryan's in the chat says, yeah, he stepped back from Gloomhaven as a game that seems to have a lot of little rough edges. Um, but he's not averse to uh, dungeon crawlers. So 
So what I was wondering, Ryan, is how accessible for your particular vision problems would Gloomhaven be? How, like, obviously, I I, I don't know your personal state. To, to, <laughs> I know you can see somewhat, right? Like, I know what you need assistance with. I just wonder how accessible Gloomhaven is considered overall. Obviously, not completely accessible. You would need help. Yeah. Um, and again, we're talking about uh, Gloomhaven, the, still the number one game out there, best with three players, but totally accessible as a game with two players, um, or even solo for that matter. So, yes. although not not accessible, accessible as solo, it's it's playable yes. as solo. It's it's playable as solo. I don't again. I, it definitely has some accessibility issues, but there's like no, there's no dice. It's cards. So if you had a way to read the cards, or if and like I said, the cards in that game, it's like the the combat deck is nice and big and bright. It's mm -hmm. the action cards. Right. So I guess it, his biggest problem is, is other people who might be willing to help and play with him in that, in that game. Yeah. So, it, so it's more the, the, the patience of the other players. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's, Fair uh, enough. Um, right. All right. So up next, I've got Spirit Island. This is a game basically that sat there and a bunch of people went, you know what I'm really sick of is all these games about exploitation and colonialism and glorification of war. How about we turn it around and let's make a cooperative game where we play the spirits defending an island from colonizers, which I think is a really cool theme. Uh, this one comes up as strongly recommended at two players on Board Game Geek, and I've seen it on multiple lists as a game. Looking at the pieces, I got to say, it looks like they made the wooden bits all different. So they're all different shapes. They're all different sizes. So it's not just a bunch of cubes. But I don't know much more about the game to know how accessible it may be. Yeah, I have to say every two player cooperative list I saw. Yeah, has this. Yeah, Spirit Island is on it, period. Um, it is rated as an 8.3 uh, on BGG. Now it's not light though. It is uh it is a 3.92 uh weight. So you're you're definitely on the high end of the scale when it comes to weight. And you're looking at about a two hour playtime as well. Yeah, this is so. this is a heavier game. Now I know it does include things like the player boards, like uh Terra Mystica or Gaia Project, so everything's on your board, everything's very tactile. I again not being not having vision problems myself, just looking at it from a third person, it looks like excuse me it has some things that were done to make the game more accessible. Now, Ryan in the chat, unfortunately, hasn't played or seen Spirit Island to, to be able to tell us if we're on the money with this one or not. Yeah, I see some I see some potential color problems. Uh, some of the uh, some of the, some of these items are, are are looking a little a little similar. But in general, the overall feel of it is is very different shapes, um, yeah. shapes and sizes. There's just this one type of piece um of its of the worshiper huts i guess uh that that could get a little uh dicey on color but uh generally again not as an expert but uh my limited experience says that uh, spirit island looks like it's got some strong potential all right up next i've got seventh continent now i know this is completely card driven but this seems like it would be really good with a helper this isn't something you're going to be able to play on your own but this seems like the perfect kind of puzzle, which way story exploration experience that I think could be great for two players to sit down and play. From what I understand, this is the kind of game where basically you guys can sit on a couch, you guys and girls, sorry. You folk could sit on a couch and sit back and one person could be doing all the work with the cards while the other person still interacts and enjoys the game. Uh, and this is the, the seventh continent, the seventh continent, correct? Yes, the seventh continent. Yeah. Um, which was re-implementing, uh, re-implemented in uh, this year by the Seventh Continent Classic Edition. Yeah, um, they're, they just keep putting out more Kickstarters. Yeah, and to, to reprint this. As soon as it goes out of print, they put out another one. Yeah, there's there's a whole lot of versions of this if you start searching it. Uh, but the Seventh Continent is where you want to where you want to start. Um, so, yeah, this uh, is one Ryan's been curious about. Thinks may work. So sounds okay. good. Excellent. Uh, that was the seventh continent for, uh, with a classic edition coming out in 2019. All right, up next is Arkham Horror the Card Game. Uh, if you want this one, rush to Amazon right now. They're cheap for, for Cyber Monday week. 
Uh, this is a collect non-collectible living card game. So this is one of those games you're going to buy the base game. You're probably going to want two copies of the base game because through you, Fantasy Flight, that's what you do to us. And then you're probably going to want expansions. And from what I hear, they have done some really evil things in this game to make it extremely difficult to win just with the base box to encourage you to buy expansions. Now, the thing is with a co-op game is you want extremely difficult because that's what has you coming back for more. Now, what I don't know is this is rated as one of the best two-player cooperative experiences on the market by many people. I don't know how well it would work playing with a partner. I honestly don't know. Like, you would obviously need help building your deck, but I don't know how you would do actually playing. Like, I don't know if it's a play your cards in front of you so you're... A uh, partner can read them off to you or if it's picking or if you can play with open hands. So that's the, the accessibility issues on this. I don't know. But from what I understand, this is like up there. I, like this beats out Gloomhaven for a two player card experience. Uh, judging by the uh, play mats I see on BGG photos, it does look like a play out in front of you. So it does. So I that don't should... think I don't think that's going to be an issue um, just based on on the, the, the uh, player images that are shown. Uh, Again, by uh... now, again, you're putting a lot of work on your partner here because they're going to have to know your deck and their deck, and they're probably going to have to read out every card you draw, and you're going to have to remember which cards they are. Like, I, I think it's going to be a little bit of weight, so you'll need someone who's got a full buy in to work together. But I think the discussion and the openness of the collectible card game of what, what, what should we put in our deck before we play in the deck building aspect, I think, could be great with two people especially cited and non, right? Because you can just sit there and while well, one person builds the deck, the other, oh, how about that card? Remember the last time we lost because of this? How about we put that in? Yeah. I think it might be really good. It's just during play, it could be rough. Yeah, and uh, it is rated number one as the number one customizable game yeah. out there right now. So oh, it's, it's blowing everything away. And from what I understand, there was another game I, I had on the list and I took it off. This is a re-implementation of the Lord of the Rings card game from Fantasy Flight. Uh, that it was also a uh, cooperative and this supposedly does it significantly better right though as ryan puts out points out the trouble is it's keeping up with the releases which is the problem with all these living card games yeah it's it's not magic i, I like the fact it's non-collectible but that doesn't mean you don't want to try to keep up with all the releases and fantasy flight loves to release new content for these games yeah. at a ridiculous amount i almost recommend as a someone who who is all about saving money on games is wait till it dies. Like if I really wanted to get into Android Netrunner, now would be the time because it's dirt cheap everywhere now that they've canceled official support. If you're not planning on going to play in tournaments, wait till the game's no longer in print. Wait till those things go down to three bucks at expansion pack on Amazon or your local game store is clearing it out because they've got the late new game in. Yep. And that was Arkham Horror, the card game. Up next, Mage Knight, the board game. I... I, I think if you did some very minor component upgrades, changes, this could be very accessible. Part of the game is collecting gems of different colors, and it uses those crystals, the plastic, I don't know what the hell they're made of, the acrylic, I think they're acrylic crystals that are now popular in all board games. Right. If you swap those up for different shapes for your different colors of mana, and then this is a deck building game, but like most deck building games, when you're playing a deck builder, you can very easily just dump your entire hand on the table and let the entire table see it, and everyone can discuss what you can play and what you shouldn't, and what you should. And I think it would work really good that way, again, with a partner. So if you have your partner there going, all right, what'd you draw this turn? You lay out your hand. Oh, okay, I think you should go over there. The board itself is a little small, but um, it uses clicks. Clicks are probably going to be a little hard to read, but again, someone else can read the stuff off. There are dice involved, but you have someone else reading the dice. Now, this is a heavy, um, Sean talked about wanting to leave Gloomhaven set up. You want to leave Mage Knight set up just to finish one game because you're looking at like sometimes six to eight hours gameplay for one scenario. This is a bigger, heavier game, but something I would think you set up a weekend where your friend comes over and the two of you sit down and you hammer through the game over the weekend, stopping for drinks, coffees, and possibly dinner. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't work as a paired game accessibility-wise. But again, it is a four hour game with a weight of 4.2. So I, I think four is being generous Four <laughs> for people who know the game well from right. my experience. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a weighty game with a with a hunk of time. But again, yeah, other than those crystals, um, it does look like it is uh, more. Um, 
Um, and Beige Ryan, Knight, no, Beige Knight can be played multiple ways. One of the ways to play is cooperative. There you go. Um, yeah, so that was a Mage Knight board game. So now there is a new edition of that, and if you are going to pick it up, there's like a, I don't know, legendary edition or something. I'm not sure what they call it, but it has all the expansions, and that's the one to pick up nowadays. Uh, Star Trek Frontiers, I can't talk about. Uh, I, I haven't played it. Uh, it I, doesn't rate as well, is about all I can say. I know they did remove the day and night cycle, which makes the game a little simpler and, well, gave it a Star Trek theme. I personally am a Trekkie. I dig the Star Trek theme, but Mage Knight, as Sean pointed out, and as I mentioned, is a very long game. And I just don't have the time to dedicate to it. So I've avoided both the new edition and the Star Trek version. Just trying to find that uh, that new version, and it's not showing up under uh, it's probably oh, the is. Lost, uh, the Ultimate Edition. There it is. Ultimate, yep. there 28, 2018, the Ultimate Edition of Mage hey. Knight. Yeah, I don't think it's a separate entry on Board Game Geek because they didn't really change anything. They just put it all no, together. No, it is actually. It wasn't oh, it on is? the versions oh. of Board Game. That's that's the that was why I was having trouble finding it. Okay, so it is a different version. Uh, and it actually ups its difficulty to four point five on if they on that <laughs> version. Well, that's probably because all the expansions tossed in. There's even yeah. more going on. Yeah. All right, up next, I got Robinson Crusoe. You are family stranded on an island playing through a deck of cards. Now, the neat thing in this game is it's kind of a which way. You're going to get cards, and you're going to make decisions based on those cards, and you're going to have to make some skill checks. This, again, seems like a game that could be perfect for a pair where one person has accessibility problems the other doesn't, because they should be that the person without the problems can, without the difficulties, and read off the cards while the other person can reply. So it's like a reading a which way book. It's, hey, do you want to go this way or this way? Talk about it together and make the decision. Roll the dice. Um, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't work. Uh, so when we're talking Robinson Crusoe, that is a very crowded search uh, on oh. Board Game Geek. Which Robinson Crusoe is it? Uh, it's from Portal Games. Portal Games. Uh... I think. <laughs> Because uh, yeah, yeah it's it comes... by Igna Ignacy Trevishek. So the the it's, adventures, it's on, adventures cursed on the cursed island. On the first island. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, re-implemented by my first Martians. Adventures on the Red Planet. Yes, not my first Martians. Just Sorry, first, yes, Martians. first Martians. Now I have heard first Martians is horrible. I, every time it, it's dirt cheap, it's online. I only hear about this because I share deals on it regularly, and people tend to point out that oh, not that POS again. Uh, so I don't know what's wrong with First Martians. I, it, it does have a significantly lower rating yeah. on Board Game Geek, so take that with uh, whatever grain of salt you'd uh, like. Yeah, I, I don't know what the difference is. Like, I do know a couple of the, the reasons, just thematically. What's more dramatic is you got bitten by a spider. What's going to happen? Or, ooh, dust got in the air vents. And just what the, <laughs> Im, the, the mental impact when you're playing the game is. I've heard that complaint. I right. guess it also had one of the worst translated rule books ever made in board gaming. Ooh. So they have released a new one. So yeah, right. there is a Robinson Crusoe second edition. I have heard that. I don't know much about it, but I don't know. I, I personally got to say the, the first Martian sounds neater, but. <laughs> All right. And so that was Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island from 2012 is the original release. Yeah, it's been out for a while. That's it's 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 a little long in the tooth, but hey. Up next, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. This is a series of games. Uh, there's certain ones are ranked a little better. This is solve a mystery, and then get insulted by Sherlock Holmes at the end, where he tells you how he did it better than you, and you rank yourself versus how well you did compared to how well Sherlock did. Um, it's uh, again, this seems like the kind of game that as a partner, right? Like. The, the person with the cited problems is going to be able to take part in the discussions and the problem solving and the interactions and the what to do next. While they may not be able to read the clues or read the newspaper articles or check out the stuff on the board, they're going to be able to participate just by being another brain at the table and another person solving the problems. Right. There are a, there are a lot of pieces of this game. There are. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I, is the, the original seems to be uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Thames Murders, and Other Cases. I think that was the, the first one, but all, all of them are standalone. Like, and they're not expansions. You just buy right. whichever one you want to play. Okay. 
Um, cause yeah, it's, it's just, again, this is another one that's sort of a thousand, uh, yeah, there's a lot, show up. Well, lots of cases. The problem with these games is, from what I understand, you can play them more than once, but it's one of those you kind of know, right? right. Like, you, you know the answer, right? So you can only play them so many times so they keep putting out more, which is going to go with another game we mentioned in two from now. <laughs> so the Sightless Fun blog actually strongly recommended this one and finds it very accessible. So this is one that right. like I, said, I think is perfect for accessibility for a mixed group, right? Like, this is also good if you've got a group of um, outgoing, boisterous players and shy players, this would be a good game for that because the the amount of interaction can be changed. It's 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 almost uh, more of an activity than a game. Uh, it looks like there's there there seems to be some sort of bouncing around with publishers between Asmodee and Space Cowboy. Uh, okay. The newest English version I can find is um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective: The Thames Murders and Other Cases, Space Cowboys English Edition from 2018. All right. So, which I think is a reprint of the original instead of a new one. I don't know. I think they're still coming out with new ones. Yeah. But uh, they seem to be reprinting it every single year. Or so, what? <laughs> be selling well, which I guess yeah. is a good thing. No, oh, absolutely. And then Ryan does point out there are lots of fan made cases out there as well. Yep. Uh, and again, so Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Thames Murders and Other Cases is the basic. All right, we already mentioned why I think deck builders work well for this. The thing is, there are not a lot of cooperative deck builders. There are some because you get to lay out your whole hand and then everyone can help you at the table. Most of the deck builders out there, it doesn't matter what order you play your cards in. So it's just a matter of, here's my flop, help me out with it. The one that is on the most list recommended strongly is Aeon's End. A lot of people are saying this is a great two-player cooperative experience. Personally, I have Aeon's End, and I don't know if they fixed it with a later edition, but I didn't find it all that amazing. The neat thing in Aeon's End is the fact that at the end of your turn, you decide what order your cards are discarded in, and you never shuffle your deck. To me, that sounds like it'd be difficult for someone with accessibility issues. Like, you'd have to have your, your partner basically tell you what order to put your cards in. I don't know. This did come up strongly recommended by many other people. And that's the main reason I threw it on the list. Like even Sean pointed it out after just a cursory search. Yeah, that it was one comes up everywhere. <laughs> every, I, every, I personally, one. I was not a huge fan of Aeon's and my copy's up for sale. It's back there right now. If you're in Windsor and you're interested, I'll sell it to you. Uh, and uh, I Aeon's and legacy is the new 2019 version. And it is not an expansion. Aeon's and is not required to play Aeon's and legacy. So. Yeah. And that is a legacy game where you're destroying stuff. So I don't know. That's a, a different ball game. But there are like five different printings of Aeon Zen, which is yeah. part of the issue with the game. I have the original printing with the worst art and the bad cards. And then they put another one with new art because it did well enough and so on. Right. I have to say, I'm still not a huge fan of the art, but uh, it does say it, it does seem to be a wildly popular game. So, yeah. you know. And not every game is for everyone. This It's one that fell flat with my group. Right. Again, that was Aeon's End. All right, this is a big one that just came out this year. Everyone's going nuts for the latest dungeon crawler from Fantasy Flight, the the, the follow-up to The Scent and Imperial Assault, Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle-Earth. From what I understand, because this is app-driven, assuming you're not completely blind, if, you're, if your vision is just impaired, that app takes care of a lot of the work for you and basically works as a helper for you. And it supposedly is really good two player and potentially best at two player. Interesting. And uh, so it's about a two hour game. Uh, again, BGG is saying best at two. Uh, yeah. And it's only, uh, it's, it's right there in the middle at about a 2.48. So, you know, 2.5. Yeah. That's right in that sort of sweet spot for weight. Now, I have heard people complain that it doesn't feel epic enough to be called Middle Earth because you're playing the little people. There's no, you're not delivering any one rings. You're never going to Isengard. You're you're doing more D&D style quests. And I've seen people note that it was uh, just not epic enough a feel for Lord of the Rings. It's the only complaint I've seen about it. And the people who complain that still had the caveat that it was still a great game. Right. It just, they wanted epic, like, come on, Lord of the Rings, it's huge. We should be traveling all over the world. I own this. I haven't gotten to it. It's I we're playing Gloomhaven. <laughs> That's my campaign game right now. Right. Uh, and it actually looks like uh, the um, the helper app is available on Steam. So right, right before Ryan was saying that it could be run on PC and while it apparently it is, it is actually available on Steam. So. 
All right, uh, so Evil John points out the problem with the game is you can't swap people in and out of your campaign. So if part of your accessibility issue is that you can't make every game session, that could be a detriment to that particular game. But to be honest, for me right now, so John's kind of joined in partway through the chat. What we're looking for is two-player only cooperative games, games that are good for two players. So once you're down to only two players, I think once one player is out, you're not, you either have a whole group or you don't, right? Yep, yep. Uh, and so this is Lord of the Rings Journey in Middle uh, Journeys in Middle Earth. Yes. Yeah, and then again, this is the follow to Descent. And Ryan was saying Descent Second Edition was one of the more accessible games out there. So this should be a good follow up because of the app. All right, getting back to the sitting down and the two of you being able to help each other out, we get to the Exit series of games. Now, the Abandoned Cabin is by far the highest rated of the series and lists best at two or three. Uh, Deanna and I played through an exit game. There are going to be things you're not going to be able to do due to vision problems, but there's going to be lots you're going to be able to do without. It's you're, you're problem solving. You're doing logic puzzles. You're putting numbers in order. You're looking at physical arrangements of things. Uh, exit games are perfect for that. Like you just really want, um, it's, it, it's the interaction, right? The, the one player can read the book. The other player can do the math or do the figuring out or rearrange all the stuff. So I think the particularly the exit the game series that are completely card driven. So Ryan's saying that uh, ex uh, escape rooms are completely off the table. So now is that personal preference or for accessibility <laughs> reasons? Uh, I did probably a little bit of both. Maybe um, <laughs> I can definitely see some people. You know, for some people, escape rooms just don't do it and don't cut yeah. it. And I totally understand that. Uh, I've done one uh, real, like you know, real escape room where we it was actually you know fully paid for um mm. you know and it had lasers and smoke and things you know all out uh and it was enjoyable but i don't think i'd want to do it again really so um yeah i'm definitely with evil john uh as he's gotten older vision problems have become an issue you'll you'll hear me rant in most of my <laughs> unboxing videos about the size of text and then which and then light on dark or dark on light Yes, and everything, no, never, never do light text on dark background. Please, please stop doing that. <laughs> Although I have to say, I'm the guy who enables dark mode on everything everywhere for light on dark to on dark text. Yeah. But that's me. No, um, I, yeah, we used a, we needed a magnifying glass to yep. play an exit game. So, yeah, because yep. everything's on small cards. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I said, where I, where I think the accessibility comes in is the fact that even with a group of four people, not everyone can look at the card at once normally when you're playing those games. So it's it's the problem solving aspect of having another brain at the table and someone else to bounce ideas off of, which is why I think the exit games are a good two player call for at least one, with one person with accessibility issues. They can be the, the the guy in the chair. Absolutely. I have to say uh, what my 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 limited experience is with the, the real escape rooms. I think they would have actually benefited from having someone visually disabled in them. Uh, because a lot of what they do in those escape rooms is putting things to Pretty distract cool. you, yeah. um, you know, unnecessary things. So someone who can, who can not necessarily see that, but sort of take it all in. Uh, awesome. Uh, there is time right. pressure is definitely a challenge for non-visual play. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Timers, timers yeah, definitely timer. are, are an issue. You're playing an exit game. Don't worry about the score. Play, play it for the experience. <laughs> play to solve it and feel good about solving it. Try to solve it without using any clues, right? That should be your goal instead of solve it in two hours. Yep. So now Will Chamberlain notes he prefers dark mode. Wait, I'm only complaining about printed text, rule books. Okay. I, I, text, green is better. Right? Okay. right now I am looking at my screen. It is black, dark gray with white <laughs> text. That is better. But printed text, I have a real hard time reading rule books that are black background or, or even worse, like starry dark backgrounds with things in right. them with bright text on top. Yep. All right. And so that was exit the game, the abandoned cabin. All right. Up next horrified. Uh, I only mentioned this cause I played a two player to play pretty good. I got to say it. I'm certain it's better with more people. Uh, it was definitely a lot of fun with five people, but there's no reason you couldn't play it two people. Um, the icons are ridiculously clear. The only thing I realized they could have done to make it more accessible, and I wish they had, is if they had put a different shape for each of the three colors of the items. Now, yes, I realize when you're reaching in the bag, I guess you could technically feel the difference. But if they had just like added a different bump on each one or something, 
but that seems like something you could easily adjust, like putting a, a bump on each of them so you could tell the three colors. But besides that, the colors are bright primary colors. Uh, you don't have a red and a green. It's blue, yellow, and red. Yep. So I, is from what I understand of color blindness, that won't be an issue. The miniatures are miniatures, so you can t tell them apart, right? Like plus they're color coded. All the cards are also color coded with very little text. There is text, and the text there is is fairly large. Uh, I the think only... from an accessibility working together two player game, yeah. it could be a lot of fun. Uh, the only the only issue I'd have is the standees. Um, again, if you don't you need to figure out where you need to bring a citizen to, you you're a little you know you need a yeah. little help there because that reading that it is can be difficulty. Hmm. Yeah, Ryan does point out two different blind board game enthusiasts who are into the game. Now, just not his style, but that yeah. doesn't change it from not being a good two-player, interactive, accessible game. Absolutely, and that is horrified. All right, uh, nowadays, I don't think you can have a podcast without mentioning this game, so we're just checking off the box to say, yes, Tabletop Bellhop has talked about Tainted Grail. Everyone is going nuts for this game. This may be the next number one game. This could be the Gloomhaven killer. People are saying that it's that good. Uh, Board Game Geek saying it's great at two as well. Yep. And so that's Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon, uh, just released 2019. Yeah, it just came in from Kickstarter. People are, are loving it. This is, like I said, potentially the next Gloomhaven, the next story-based, campaign-based fantasy RPG set in the Arthurian period. Huge books. Which way? I don't know. People are going nuts for this thing. Personally, I haven't played it, but you know what? It took me two years to get into Gloomhaven, so <laughs> it's rocketing up the scales. We'll see. I Personally, I, I'm thinking right now there's a lot of people who spent a lot of money who are happy to get the thing they spent their money on and have, um, what do you call that? Buyer's, um, not buyer's remorse, the yeah, opposite. The, opposite the, the bias. A bias, buyer's bias, a yeah. price bias. They're, they're justifying yeah. their cost, but yeah. I could be wrong. Maybe the game's just that good. Uh, so yeah, as of right now, it is uh, 113 or 813th overall, but 112 on the thematic charts. So it yeah. is uh, and getting up there. Uh, and yes, that is from Awaken Realms, Nanister. Yeah. yeah, everyone's going nuts. So they, people are literally saying this could be the Gloomhaven killer. It could be, could be the next number one game. We'll see. And once again, that is Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. Uh, so next up, uh, my entry for this one is actually Hogwarts Battle. Um, this is again where one where it's uh, it's a great four player game, but if you have two players, you each play two characters, uh, and it's really quite enjoyable. It's all open information; everything's down on the table. Uh, there's no you know you you draw your hand and then lay it down on the table because it doesn't matter if anyone else knows mm -hmm. uh, what you've got or not. Um, so the open information; it's a great co op. To work with people, uh, and again, it's it's one of those games where it's hard. Uh, so yeah. it's that co it's that cooperative hardness you want to keep you coming back to it because you haven't just blown through the whole thing quickly. Uh, and if the original box isn't hard enough for you, that monsters <laughs> box of monsters is a killer. Uh, so yeah, uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is uh, is my strong recommendation. I didn't see that on anyone else's recommendation list, but it, I played it solid, played it with the girls. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of text on the cards, but no. it's definitely reading. It's definitely that deck building. Someone's going to have to read out all the cards. Yeah. But I think because of the iconography, especially for the spells, you could probably Yeah, no, learn absolutely. Both. There really isn't even that much reading, really. Uh, you get sort of uh, through it pretty quickly uh, once, you've, you know, once you've been through them and, and, you, and you associate yeah. uh, the pictures the symbol, with the, the picture things. You with know, the, yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, uh, and then in the chat, we had uh, the mention of Street Masters early on, which is uh, very highly regarded, uh, looks like. It's uh, it's another one of those fighting game, uh, miniature battle sort of uh, games. Plays great at two with a really great BGG rating. That's one I don't know at all. I somehow missed that game. I know nothing about it. You said it, and I'm like, nope, never even <laughs> heard of it. Yeah, no, it's uh, is an eight five with a weight of two seven. That's a two player co op, or uh, two or more, I think you said. Yeah, so it, they they call it a one to four. The community says one to three, best one two. Okay. Um, best one uh, two yeah. is a good sign. And it's, I mean, just looking at that front box, it looks like they've just ripped off a Street Fighter game. Um, it's. I think what's interesting is that it's co op. 
Yeah. Like, like there's all the, like, I really dig, like, we're, this is a totally different topic, but the Indines, the War of Indines, Devastation of Indines, which is a two-player, 2D fighter done as a board game, but they're very much not co-op games. That's right. The, that's the exact opposite. Now, it does look like it might be a, that much of a better game if you were jumped in on the Kickstarter and picked oh, up sure. all the stretch goals and things. Yeah. It looks like they did uh, pack it full of goodies. But, uh, yeah, uh, Xanister says it's like the old side-scrolling beat-em-up arcade oh, okay. games. So, basically, right. yeah, you, the old, uh, the old Street Dragon. Fighter Double Dragon. Or Double Dragon. Double Street Dragon, Fighter. sorry, yes. Makes sense. Excellent. All right, did we see anything else in the chat? That anyone um, else recommended? Uh, we did get recommendations I saw for uh, Spirit Island, which we had mentioned earlier in the show. Thank you for joining us, Eric Class. Yep. Uh, Ryan, Ryan's recommend, uh, mentioning um, Shadowfront Crossfire, co-op mode, okay. co-op mode, Conquest of Planet Earth. So Shadowrun Crossfire seemed like a lot of text on those cards. Like compared to every other deck builder I've seen, like the the it makes that Arkham Horror look light. So I don't know about that. Like, I've seen it, and I'm just like, man, there's a lot of stuff on those cards. Right. Uh, and he mentions uh, Co-op Star Planet Realms. Co-op Star Realms, that's a good idea. Star Realms is definitely a, a nice one. Again, any deck builder where you, you don't, you can play your cards in any order. Where right. it's not one of those, like, uh, like I don't think Four Worlds would be a good recommendation. Right. Where you may want to keep a card in your hand for next turn, or say Tyrants of the Underdark, I think. Probably not a really good one, but those that's not cooperative. So, but Star Realms Cooperative, where you're fighting against, where you throw the the monsters, I, I actually, I tend to forget you can play Star Realms Cooperative. Uh, I would assume then Hero Realms, you can the same as well? I don't know myself. Because <laughs> uh, Hero Realms has a slightly higher rating, although I, I could just be, uh, I could just be a numbers, a numbers thing, because it's not statistically different, I don't think. And thank you, John, for the term confirmation bias. That was the one I was looking for. Yep. All right. I thought I had seen some more in the chat, but I think we're probably pretty good. So we got to ask Ryan, did we point out anything new to you? Did we find you a new game to check out? How was, did we do how our was job our, yeah, today? How was the suggestions from the bellhop? As we deal with uh, what uh, the little lag that's happening today? Eh, possibly. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Defenders, Defenders of the Realm, the that's, that's the fantasy-style pandemic-like game where you're trying to defend against dragons, which I've right. actually never played. Larry yeah. Elmore artwork. Ryan loves uh, Defenders of the, Defenders there of the Realm, go. apparently. There we go. All right. All the things, that's awesome. That one I didn't see on anyone's list. I personally haven't played it. Right. Hmm. Every time I join this channel, I order another game. Take hey, we're, note. we're doing something right. Yeah, take note, uh, publishers. <laughs> yes, take note, publishers. All right, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.